morning, Lifeway. I wanted to share with you the name of our first worship song today is Zeal. In preparation to this week, I wanted to know exactly what zeal meant. So according to Google, it's an eagerness and enthusiastic interest in pursuit of something. Well, I want, I want that. I want that daily eagerness and enthusiastic interest in pursuit of Christ. My first, my feet may be on this earth, but my heart is full of heaven. Let's all stand and worship together. of zeal. So I wanted to read to y'all from Romans 10. Paul is talking about the Jews, um, his brothers and sisters who are the Israelites. And he says that his prayer is for them to be saved. 
He knows what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would direct our zeal specifically on you, God. In this life, there are so many things to be enthusiastic and excited about, Lord, but I pray that you would triumph over that all in our hearts, Lord. I pray that as we continue to worship you this morning, that you would set our hearts and our attention on you, God, and that our passion would be you. In Jesus' name, amen. Revealing heaven's wonders Spirit come, Spirit come What you spoke is now unfolding All your children shall be holding Dreams awaken in this moment Spirit come, Spirit come, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this house, pour it out, let your love run over. Let your glory fill this house Now the world awaits your presence And this power is within us We will rise to be your witness Oh, uh-huh. 
king is soon returning as we hold to this assurance spirit come spirit come spirit
Lifeway, how are you this morning? Man, it's great to see all of you. You know, uh, I noticed we're in the back row today. I try to pick a different seat to sit in every Sunday. Um, and I noticed that we're running out of seats. How amazing is that? That is awesome, yeah. So, <clears throat> welcome all of you here, new and not so new with us, into our family here at Lifeway. It's just such a blessing to have all of you here with us. For those of you that tune in online with us, welcome also. I know some of you are here because you tuned in online with us. Uh, some of you just continue to tune in online with us. And again, we are so blessed to have you guys join us, whether it be at home or on vacation or across the country. Just join in our family this morning. It's so awesome. Um, if you're new this morning, with us, make sure you stop by our guest services as we have a gift for you. Uh, it's just a, a small gift just to show you that we welcome you to our family. So, welcome again. Um, <clears throat> there's a group of ladies in Rock Hill in the York area my wife works with that have noticed a problem. As we all have noticed this problem, um, Homelessness. We've noticed people standing with signs, needing food for their families, needing money just to get through the day. And sometimes you pull up, and I know if I ask to raise hands today, how many of us just sit at the red light and look straight forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's why I didn't ask you to raise your hand. Because I know we're all sinners anyways, and we probably lie in church. So... <clears throat> What these group of ladies have done is put together stoplight bags with necessities, water, crackers, combs, stuff like that in these bags, and they're available for you to pick up as you go out today. They're right beside the guest services desk. Just feel free to take as many as you want. You know, I go to Charlotte every day. I see a lot 
a lot of people standing on the sides of the road. And being in a cashless society that we're in now, I don't have money to give to them. But these stoplight bags make a huge difference in just them just standing there. That's all they need is a drink of water, some crackers, just to get them through their day. So if you want any of the right outside there, beside the guest services, next Sunday, we are going to do the back to school blessing. So next Sunday, we're going to ask our students, maybe even to bring their backpacks with them. We're going to have all of our kids from Kids Life in here. And we're going to take a moment and pray with them for this school year. This school year, the confidence that God can carry them through this school year and that you are there to support them as a family, as a church, and support our community through praying for them and loving them and just helping them with anything. It's a lot easier for these students to come to one of us than it is to go to their parents, especially with questions and stuff about God or just life. They feel more comfortable going to one of you guys. So we're going to bless those backpacks next Sunday. Um, three Sundays from now, I think is what it is, we're going to have a church picnic. A church picnic. It's right there, September the 11th at 3.30. That's going to be at Westminster Park, right? Hey, I got that right. So Westminster Park is where it's going to be. There's a sign-up sheet right out front for that. Um, make sure you sign up. I think we're asking maybe somebody to bring just a dessert. Food's going to be covered. If you want something that you want to eat for a dessert, like key lime pie, uh, chocolate-covered bacon. She's not here, but I know chocolate-covered bacon, something like that. If you want something there, bring it with you as a dessert. So, yeah, chocolate-covered bacon is good for any time, not just dessert. But, uh, yeah, so that's September the 11th. And then uh, we have something we did uh, several years ago, and COVID kind of knocked us out of us doing this every year, is a Financial Peace University. So it's a great class to go through. It's, it's well led by our leaders of that Financial Peace University, and it just gives you a better opportunity to navigate through your finances and how you spend your money and how you look at it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just five dollars for a monster drink. Just a dollar for a pack of crackers. It's a dollar for my honey buns. But that adds up. And at the end of the week you spend a hundred dollars on nonsense. So Financial Peace University, it covers way more than what I cover. You notice I only talked about food. So Make sure if you want to be a part of our Financial Peace University, there's also a sign-up sheet out there, and we got a little video to show you what it's all about. I thank all of you again for being here. We love you and enjoy. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Are you really going to make the hard choices to change your life. We had 40,000 in student loans, uh -huh. 17,000 in cars. I owned a rental property. We in had a line of credit, just stuff. We had 16 credit cards. The proverb says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes. We paid off $83,000. Wow, when desire comes. $144,000. When desire comes. $450,000 in the last seven years. Wow, it is the tree of life. God says this is how you get out of debt. You gotta run, 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 run. run. There is no doubt that this process called Financial Peace University works. The only question is whether you're gonna be involved. And so if you haven't signed up yet, now is the time.
Good morning, Lifeway. Uh, my name is Brandon. Uh, I'm back. I was here two weeks ago. Uh, this is our fourth week in discussing religious trauma in this series. And we've been explaining how human organizations can sometimes uh, hurt people because they're full of people. And like Eric said, we are sinners and we have different personalities and quirks and things. Uh, and we end up sinning, sinning against one another. Uh, and that causes pain and it can cause uh, trauma. So we've been trying to teach how Jesus guides us through uh, forgiveness, uh, having, remaining teachable, having a teachable spirit, and what correct judgment uh, would look like within the church. And really, we've been trying to paint a picture, sort of, uh, of what the church should be and what it really can be or could be. So we've used this definition for religious trauma um, throughout the series, and it's it is this, that religious trauma is emotional distress with lasting, <clears throat> excuse me, lasting adverse effects caused by physical, mental, social, emotional, or spiritual abuse that is connected to religious belief, practice, or structure. So if I were to simplify that at all, I would just say that it's any past hurt that keeps you from worshiping Jesus and loving his church uh, like you should. And I'm going to make this week's connection to religious trauma a little bit uh, later in the sermon, so hopefully you can, you can get ahead of me in your head and you can see where I'm going with it. Uh, that'll be kind of a, a challenge for you, I guess. Uh, but this week I'm going to be teaching on the conscience, uh, and I don't remember exactly what brought this on. Uh, this was not a part of the plan. You know, it's funny how God, you know, you make plans and God's busy laughing and changing them for you. Uh, so that's kind of what happened. Uh, so we're going to go over some specific examples of what a, what a matter of conscience would be and uh, how we're supposed to handle it, and we're going to finish with connecting uh, how religious trauma could be connected to the conscience. So what are matters of conscience? Uh, so these are things that some people could be really convicted about, and other people are like, I don't, I don't understand, it doesn't bother me at all to do that thing or to watch that movie or whatever it is. So some, I gave a list uh, up here, that some matters of conscience that you may have experienced discussion or debate over. Uh, the first one mentioned is drinking alcohol. Some people are really convicted about alcohol. They're like, nope, not in my house, can't ever, couldn't take a sip. I would feel really guilty about that. Uh, and that's for many different reasons. And other people are like, well, Jesus drank wine and I think I'm good too. And uh, the second one, watching R-rated movies. Some people feel they really need to abstain from that, and others are like, eh, it doesn't bother, doesn't bother me. Taking on debt, both as individuals and as a church, that can be a matter of conscience. The use of social media. Some people see that it is, you know, it's Satan's tool, and they might be right, but uh, other people aren't convicted by use of social media at all, and they see some benefits in it. Uh, getting tattoos, uh, language, what are acceptable and unacceptable words for Christians to use. Uh, music can be a matter of conscience. Uh, bars or going to restaurants that serve alcohol. Uh, some of these are older, you know, dancing, uh, playing card games or gambling, wearing jewelry, even celebrating holidays can be matters of conscience. So some people, they have really strong convictions about these things while others don't. And we're going to look at various passages in the Bible uh, that will tell us why it's actually, it's okay, and it's expected that some people will have a really convicted conscience about these things while others don't, and we need to learn how to respect one another enough to accept those differences and to not trample over each other. And that's, that's where we're, we're really going to focus on what, what do we do about these things? What, what actions do we take? But by way of throwback, I want to go back to, to Mark's sermon last week just for a second. Um, he preached in Matthew 7 and the do not judge passage, and he explained how often when people throw that verse around, it's a mind your own business is really what they're trying to say to you. And we learned that judge not means to not, not to love them not or act not. It's uh, that we are supposed to, to, within the house of the Lord, have some discernment and try to help one another get over sins that we ourselves have had victory over. But at the end of the sermon, Mark mentioned a group of people. He mentioned a few different groups uh, that we could sort of associate ourselves with. And this one group uh, was the group that he said 
they needed to listen or they admitted that they needed to listen to people. That they had gotten good advice or good warnings from people, uh, but they, they may have had that mind your own business thought, but then hindsight, they're like, well, I probably should have listened to that. And that's kind of what your conscience is, knowing what is right and wrong. So when your conscience says, yeah, I should probably listen to what they're saying, that's, that's your conscience, right? Telling you what's, what's right. So your conscience, when it's well-trained and working properly, it senses what is right and what is wrong. It tells you which path you should go, which direction you should take. So your conscience will tell you what is right and wrong, good, evil, things like that. But really, what is it, right? It's not something you can really put your hand on. So for the sake of this sermon, I want everybody to uh, pretend with me, right? Pretend that your conscience is an organ inside your body somewhere, right? And that organ in your body, it senses things, right? It senses right and wrong for you. So this organ is, is similar to your eyes or your nose or your skin because your eyes sense light, your nose senses smell, your skin senses touch. And similar to these other sensory organs, right, your, your, uh, your conscience, this, this organ that we're pretending in our body, can be damaged and it cannot function properly from time to time, right? So if you, like your eyes, if I were to stare up at these lights uh, for an extended period of time, my eyes would be damaged from them, right? I'd see black spots probably, maybe have cataracts develop, something like that. Your eyes will be damaged to where they can't sense light appropriately anymore. Or your skin, if you touch, touch the hot stove, you're going to sear or cauterize your skin, you're going to burn yourself, and then that skin is probably never going to have that feeling back the way it was before. So likewise, your conscience can be damaged, it can be seared, and it can malfunction to where it does not sense right and wrong anymore, not in the way that it should. It sort of loses some of that ability. And we can't, this is really why we can't always trust our conscience, right? There's, there's kind of three malfunctions of the conscience that I'm going to mention today. So I'll have the list up here, but the first one being a seared or hardened conscience. Uh, the second would be a defiled or, or perverted, distorted uh, conscience. And the last one we'll mention is a, a weak or an oversensitive conscience, okay? So we're going to go through each of these and see what the Bible says about them. So why we can't always trust it, the first malfunction would be a seared, a cauterized, hardened conscience. When you know something is wrong, but you don't, you don't feel that it's wrong. Like maybe in your head you're like, yeah, this is wrong, but it doesn't bother me to do it. I'll just go do it anyway. Right? That would be a, a seared conscience. And in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, uh, he sort of describes this with, with certain people. It says, now the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. So their conscience is seared. They're, they're not literally burned. You know, it's, your conscience isn't a physical organ. We're pretending it is, but uh, it's not. Uh, but once you get a burn, you, you don't feel things in it. Once the initial pain goes away, it's kind of like it's just dead. You don't feel the touch anymore. It's the same idea with your conscience. It's not functioning properly. An another passage is Jeremiah 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeremiah 6. The people in Jeremiah's day, they were in rebellion against God. And uh, he, as the prophet of God, he was... Uh, trying to get them to, to become right in their relationship with God. So he's, he's pronouncing warnings, and he's really describing the hearts of the people. In Jeremiah 6, 13, says this, it says, For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is making profit dishonestly. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have treated my people's brokenness superficially, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they acted so detestably? They weren't at all ashamed. They can no longer feel humiliation. Therefore, they will fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they will collapse, says the Lord. So these people, they no longer felt shame, right? They couldn't feel humiliation, right? And this question just, it really bugged me, and this was something I've had to reflect on all week, so I get to 
pass it off to you now and ask you the question, what do you no longer feel shame about in your life? Is there, a, is there a sin in your life that you used to feel shame or humiliation, something you used to hide, but maybe now you're even bold about it, that you're, you're almost proud of that sin? Is there anything in your life? I just want to pose that question to you and, and let you kind of stew on that because I had to stew on that this week. But the leaders in this day that, that Jeremiah is talking about, he says that the leaders are proclaiming peace when there is no peace. What they're trying to do, they're trying to pacify the people's conscience to ease them. Like they may be feeling conviction, but I don't, I don't want you to feel conviction. No, you're good with God. Don't worry about that. See, the, we look at the world today and we can find, we could find many preachers even that do this, right? They say things like, you don't have to change your sinful lifestyle. God loves you anyway. He'll just look over it. It's no big deal. God's not really concerned with those sins, you know, and they, they're trying to do the same thing that these leaders were doing in Jeremiah's day. They're trying to pacify your God-given conscience that's telling you something's wrong. And you're, they're trying to get you to ignore it. They're trying to prevent you from feeling the appropriate and right shame and humiliation for that sin, for that bad behavior. So having a seared or cauterized or hardened conscience is like when your conscience gets scar tissue built up, Right? And I, I kept thinking uh, for a good example, and I know we have quite a few guitar players, and uh, I was wondering if there's anybody that has uh, been a guitar playing quitter like myself. I tried to learn, right? And I was like, man, this hurts a lot. I'm not going to do something that causes me pain, right? And everybody can, that's played or picked up a guitar knows that those strings cut into your fingers at first, right? It causes a lot of pain until you get calluses built up, and then you don't feel it as much, and then you can probably have more joy in playing guitar at that point. Um, but in this case, you don't want that to happen to you, right? You don't want that sin, which would be the, the guitar string digging into your finger. You don't want your conscience to not feel the wrongness of your action. You want to feel that. You don't want that calloused heart. So I, ho I hope that illustration sort of helps drive that point home, of that, that pain that you should feel from your conscience. The second reason, though, that you can't always trust your conscience is because your conscience can become defiled or perverted or it can become a lying conscience. It's like if you have a moral compass, right, to have a, a, another metaphor for it, your moral compass should point north, right? But this would be when your compass is actually pointing the exact opposite direction. It's pointing south, okay? So your, your moral compass is off, it's excusing behaviors that it just shouldn't, and it's actually advocating for them. So in Titus chapter 1 uh, is where I'd like to take you first for this point. Uh, Titus 1 uh, verse 15 and 16 says, To the pure everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. So both their mind and their conscience are defiled, right? Their, their thinking and their feeling is both wrong about the subject, whatever it is, whatever that sin is. And this, I'll, I'll take you again to the Old Testament, Isaiah. Uh, there's a similar uh, instance in the prophets, right? Isaiah's writing about Judah's sins, that he's, he's pronouncing woes over the people for their bad behavior. And in Isaiah 5, uh, verse 20 through 23, I'll read, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who consider themselves wise and judge themselves clever, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine, who are champions at pouring beer, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of justice. So here he's calling out their sins. He's pronouncing their woes over them of, of the, the coming judgment and punishment that's coming to them because they've, they've flip-flopped everything. Evil is now good, bitter is sweet, darkness is light. That compass is pointing firmly south and not north. 
right? This malfunction of the conscience is when it's not just hardened or insensitive anymore, but it's actually just totally distorted. It's flip-flopped. And you can see this in the world today. People's conscience has flipped largely as a, as a society in, in the United States, right? We're calling for justice while, meanwhile, we're redefining justice to actually mean injustice, at least by God's standards. We have people that are advocating the killing of children up to and even beyond the point of birth. There's practice of actual racism, and then we call it anti-racism. Our conscience can clearly be defiled. It can be distorted. It can be messed up. So these first two malfunctions of conscience are when the conscience is, is not really sensitive enough. This third malfunction that I'll mention of conscience is when your conscience is too sensitive. It's like hyperactive, okay? And this is, we're going to refer to it as weak or overly sensitive. And a person's conscience can be overly sensitive, and Paul, I use the term weak because that's what the Apostle Paul uses. He, he uses that term weak, that their conscience convicts them about everything, right? That's not even explicitly in Scripture, okay? And we use this word, it's not meant to be a put-down. And I would bet we all actually have weak conscience about something in our lives, you know, something that you're just more sensitive to. Uh, and we can have that for many reasons, right? We can have a weak conscience because of a past sin in your life that you're really sensitive to and you don't want to relapse into. Uh, you could have it because of uh, you were raised in a community that chose to abstain from certain things and that you were just raised in it, so it's stuck in your head that I just can't get over it. It's just wrong in my mind. And you shouldn't be disobedient to that. You, you should stick with that, that conscience. Um, but it, it could be a past experience. Maybe you were raised in a house with an alcoholic, and you're like, I'm not going anywhere. You can't get me within three feet of a drink. You know, I'm not going to drink alcohol. So it's not wrong to have a weak conscience necessarily. But we need to know that it can be a malfunction of your conscience to be overly sensitive and to just be anxious about all these matters of conscience. So I'll mention this uh, real briefly here, but Paul talks about uh, weak conscience in a few different letters, in Romans and in uh, 1 Corinthians. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he just mentions this. Um, it says, however, not everyone has this knowledge some have been so used up to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So what's going on is Paul writes about this food sacrifice to idols, something that we, we can't really relate to in our day, but apparently it was a big matter of conscience thing that the church had to deal with early on because Paul wrote so much about it. So some people had this knowledge, he's saying, that they know that food sacrificed to idols is nothing because the idols are nothing. There's only one true God. So they can feel free and eat whatever the food is and don't ask the question. But other people were so ingrained in that society, in that culture, in that paganism, that they couldn't, in their mind, in their conscience, they could not get around, I can't eat this food. It's, it's been sacrificed to an idol. It's, it's like me worshiping them. I just can't do it, right? So that's what's going on. It's this matter of conscience that we all have to deal with. Some, some more modern examples I've mentioned is the alcohol, the social media. Uh, and we just consider that some people have a, a weak or a tender conscience about these, these things. And like the, the strong people aren't looking down or shouldn't be looking down on the, the weaker people. That's not, that's not at all what's, what should be going on. Uh, it's just realizing that everyone can have a weak conscience and we need to respect and maybe even talk about why you have that weak conscience. So you can't always trust your conscience, but you can't safely ignore it either. Um, that's something we, we really need to understand. You can't always trust it, but you can't safely ignore it. Um, why we can't ignore it? Well, in James... James, he mentions this in chapter 4, uh, verse 15, uh, yeah, about 15 through 17 here. It says, instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, he will live, or excuse me, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And here's, here's the real, the point right here in verse 17. So it is sin to know the good and yet not 
do it, to know the good. So if your conscience tells you what the good is, you know what the good is, your conscience is telling you this is the good thing, and you don't do it, James is saying that is sin. So if you are ignoring your conscience when it's telling you something, you could be sinning, you could be in sin. Another uh, example of this, of why you can't uh, safely ignore your conscience, is in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy verse 1, chapter, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 18 says, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. So if you've rejected uh, faith and a good conscience, you could be shipwrecking your faith. So it's sin against God, and you could be shipwrecking your faith if you ignore your conscience. So, there, so there's some negative consequences with ignoring your conscience. But there's also positives to giving your conscience attention. Right? These, are, these are things that benefit you. Right? In 1 John uh, 19, or th- excuse me, First John chapter 3, verse 19. It says this, This is how we will know that we belong to the truth, that we reassure our hearts before Him. When even our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and He knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive whatever we ask from Him because we keep His commands. And do what is pleasing in his sight. Now this is his command, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. So having a, this confidence, he mentions in verse 21, we have confidence before God if our heart doesn't condemn us. If our conscience doesn't condemn us, then we can have confidence before God. Right? That is a, a clear benefit that we have. Having a clear or clean conscience before God uh, gives us confidence in His presence. We can approach His throne. We can confess our sins knowing that He is, is loving and faithful to forgive us our sins. And we can repent and turn away and be in a right relationship with Him. And I'm kind of glad that the uh, baptism tanks down here this morning. This, this reminded me of the feeling I had. I remember very distinctly the day that I was baptized walking out of the church, and I felt so clean in, in a way. Like, all I, I was just dunked in water, right? It's not soapy water. It doesn't have bleach in it or anything. But, but I just felt so clean walking out of the church that day. Like, wow, I've, I have a clear conscience before God. I'm in a right relationship with Him. And it's just this peace that came over me. So I was, I was very thankful that, that, that uh, Mark decided to put that up there for, for my illustration, I guess. <laughs> but, but anyway, there's, there's benefits for having this confidence in the presence of God. But there's, there's other benefits from this, right? Uh, back in uh, 2 Corinthians, I don't think I marked this one. It might take me a second. Uh, so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if I can get there. Uh, verse 12, Paul says this, Indeed, this is our boast, the testimony of our conscience is that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you with godly sincerity and purity, uh, not by human wisdom but by God's grace. So not only can you have confidence towards God if you have a clear, or clean conscience, you can have a confidence towards your fellow man, right? You can have confidence uh, before them you, to know that you have acted rightly in the world, that you have treated people that you interact with in the world rightly. You can have confidence in those relationships, and that will also bring you peace. So having confidence towards God and confidence towards man is a benefit of a clear conscience. So let's connect it now to religious trauma, right? When you have this, these issues of conscience, right? And now what, is, what does it do, or what, what have we maybe experienced in the church uh, among groups or even as individuals where this, this matters of conscience have caused traumatic, painful things. And there's really two angles that probably cause trauma that you may have experienced and I know I have experienced. One of them is, is legalism, which this probably isn't a, you know, a proper definition of it, but I view it as 
trying to bind someone's conscience with some sort of unbiblical view. You're trying to place extra laws on somebody else because you have this conviction, so you're like, well, they should have it too, so I'm going to bind them up, bind their conscience with what my conscience is telling me. So that's, that's what legalism is. And this is generally not, it's not done to harm people. It's generally done out of a, a fear of sin or a desire to not sin against a holy God. So they add extra rules and they try to restrict their conscience and they try to restrict other people's conscience with legalism. And that, that's not good. That can cause us a pain. Uh, the second one would be like a lawlessness or even what, what would fall under progressive Christianity today where you're loosing someone's conscience. You're, you're trying to do like those teachers in Jeremiah's day. Say, say there's peace, peace with God. You don't have anything to worry about. You're good. God forgives all these things. Don't worry about it. You don't have to change that sin in your life. You don't have to flee from that sin. God might even, t- might even encourage you for that. It's not sin anyway. You know, let's redefine that. So that's what lawless, lawlessness or, or a progressive Christian, when they're trying to loosen your conscience. And that can lead to you doubting yourself like, well, gee, I don't, you know, I've, I'm really convicted about this, but everyone acts like I'm nuts. You know, I feel like I shouldn't do this, but they're telling me it's okay. They're trying to pacify your conscience. And, we, you know, people, they try to avoid saying the hard things sometimes. You know, it's not, it's not enjoyable to tell people that you're living contrary to the will of God, right? That your anger, your violence, drunkenness, fornication, adultery, lust, gluttony. Gluttony is a good one, right? Uh, God is... To say God isn't worried about these things would say that God's character has just miraculously changed all of a sudden. Like now he, he doesn't care about holiness and righteous living. And that's a very dangerous place to be. That can cause a lot of damage to someone's life by telling, trying to pacify their conscience and make them okay with sin. And that's something we should definitely, definitely avoid at all costs. So we, we avoid practices where we push our conscience on other people is what we need to do. But we, we can do something about this, right? We're not just subject to the whims of our conscience, what we're convicted of and what we're not. We can do something about this. We, our conscience can be strengthened. It can be matured so that we understand God's Word better. We can sort of fine-tune that, that internal organ there. So this is how we move forward, right? This is how we're going to protect and prevent future hurts from happening over the matter of conscience. So the first thing we can do is read Scripture, okay? That's the first thing we can do to strengthen or mature our conscience. So whether you have a conscience that's too sensitive or it's not sensitive enough, just reading Scripture and knowing how God has revealed Himself can help fix both of those problems, being oversensitive or undersensitive in your conscience, I know um, a pastor I listen to frequently, Mike Winger, uh, on YouTube, he, um, he said Scripture is like corrective lenses or glasses that correct our conscience. And I would even go a step further that Scripture isn't just corrective lenses. It's like, it's like LASIK eye surgery. Like it, it can just fix your eyes, actually, right? It can fix your eyes on Jesus and fix your conscience. And what, what starts to hurt your conscience will, hurt, will be what hurts Jesus's. Uh, heart. So the second thing, though, that we can do to mature our conscience is to sit under and find good teaching. Now, two weeks ago, I preached on this, that that someone that faithfully approaches the task of teaching uh, with the fear of the Lord and with a humble, uh, teachable spirit, a love of truth in them, can help you train your conscience. They can point you to Scripture. They can point you to God's truth to either make your conscience more sensitive or less sensitive about a certain matter. And this is actually, Paul mentions this as one of the goals of his teaching uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. It says, now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So a love that comes from a good conscience. Having a good, clean, finely tuned conscience uh, is where that should be the starting place of where good teaching and instruction comes from. And that can help us mature and grow our conscience properly. 
The third thing we can do to strengthen or mature our conscience is to just abstain, right? We don't have to do all the things that we have the freedom to do. Uh, The Bible doesn't tell us we have to fix a weak conscience. You can check it out for yourself. Read all the passages about a weak conscience. Paul never goes into, and this is how you fix your weak conscience. That's That's not mentioned. A weak conscience is not a problem, right? You can just choose to obey your conscience that's weak in that area. There's a, there's a reason that it's weak in that area for you. Like I said, it may be a, a sin you're particularly weak about and you want to stay as far away from it as you can. That's okay. That's good, right? But you can, you can abstain from that. And then perhaps, you know, over time with sitting under good teaching and reading Scripture, maybe your conscience won't be as weak about that topic anymore. Maybe it's something you can soften up about. I know this has happened to me for a few different things, um, there, there was a time, you know, in my past that, you know, alcohol, I just grew up with it. It was part of the thing, you know, that we did. But I kind of swung full the other direction of not in my house. I don't want to be near it. I don't want anything to do with it. It causes problems. And now I've kind of, you know, I've softened a little more in that matter of conscience. I don't drink myself, but my view of other people now is softer because I recognize it is a matter of conscience that uh, you can choose to abstain or partake in. So perhaps you could grow in that way. Uh, The last way uh, that you can grow or mature your conscience, and I think this is really the big one, this is really important, is to learn to respect one another and love one another. And really, that comes out as as giving deference or showing deference, putting others before yourself. Okay, And I'm going to read a few passages out of Romans 14. I'm going to kind of string them together to sort of summarize the chapter on this because Paul does such a good job in this chapter um, describing the weak and the strong conscience and how we're supposed to uh, live with one another. But I would encourage you, I strongly encourage you to read Romans 14 this week and really meditate on it and see what it is that you should be doing with your conscience, what your strong conscience is and what your weak conscience is and how you live that out. Uh, among people that disagree. So I'm going to read a a few of these verses, starting in verse 3 here, and I'll kind of bounce through, but it says, one who eats, this is the food sacrifice title thing coming up again, uh, must not look down on the one who does not eat. One who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another household servant? Before his own Lord, he stands or falls. He will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than another. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. Let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. It is a good thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. So the point here throughout that chapter, I tried to pull the the verses that make the point of how you behave towards one another is really the key thing, right? If we treat one another with respect, give them deference, we're going to live differently. People will see that and it will ultimately bring God glory. So I'd like to wrap up with this, this final closing thought, I guess, is that we can make our lives more strict or more restricted uh, in order to have a clear conscience. We can choose to do that. We can choose to abstain from certain things, right? However, you can't give yourselves more liberty or more freedom because of your conscience, especially freedom to commit sin, right? Adultery isn't just okay because it doesn't hurt your conscience anymore, right? Your, your fornication is not okay because it's, it's just love and I don't have a conscience that convicts me about it, so it's all right with me, right? 
you, your drunkenness is not okay because it doesn't bother your conscience anymore. You cannot make sin acceptable because of your conscience. Your conscience cannot take the place of God. It can't always be trusted. But knowing God, knowing who He is, knowing what He calls sin and fleeing from it will get you to a right relationship with God. And if you have, if you have sinned against someone in, in a matter of conscience, if you've tried to convict someone of what your conscience is telling you, or if you've tried to loosen someone's conscience, or you, you've perhaps shamed someone for having a weak conscience, if you've flaunted your lack of conscience in front of somebody, if you're more concerned about your own liberty than what's hurting your brother or sister in Christ, then I'm going to encourage you today to, to make that right. Find that person. Ask forgiveness. Right? Listen to your conscience right now. What, it, what is it telling you? Which relationship do you need to try to have some reconciliation in these matters? Between friends, family members, especially with God. There's no reason to wait even for the closing song to end today. We will all look over it and I'll be praising God if you got up in the middle of the song and went to a brother or sister in Christ and said, you know, I think I sinned against you in this matter. Step outside, make a phone call to somebody if you need to. Just don't ignore what your conscience is telling you. Get a clear conscience before God. Repent. Turn away from that sin that you have. Ask Him for forgiveness and experience the freedom, the liberty that you have with a right relationship with God. Experience that, that clean feeling of having a right relationship with your Creator. So church, would you please pray with me here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, your revelation, and the guidance that it gives us. I pray that everyone hears the signal through the noise, that they hear your truth through my words. Lord, I thank you most of all for your son Jesus dying on the cross and, and rising again to clear away anything that's standing in the way of our having a right relationship with you. Father, and it's in his name, Jesus' name that we pray.
to celebrate. Brandon, great job this morning. I was so excited uh, to hear what he had to say, and uh, man, it's just really timely in our world, and so I'm so grateful for that. And it just so happens we did put this out today uh, just for you, but we thought we'd take advantage of it. And uh, we're going to have uh, just a moment to celebrate uh, baptism with two of our folks, and so I'm, I'm th we're thrilled about this. And uh, we always invite our older children to come in and observe this because they are getting to the point of making decisions in their life about following Jesus and making Him first in their life. And uh, we want them to see that because it helps them understand what this is about. It's not something to be scared of. It really is uh, simply observing what Jesus asks us to do as a way of publicly saying to the world that we've put our faith and trust in Him. That's what baptism is. It's a symbolic act. And we're so excited to be able to celebrate that today. And if this is something that you uh, would be interested in doing and like more information about, if you'll stop by guest services as you leave today, we have a couple of booklets. We have a booklet for our students and adults called Baptism, the Big Plunge. And then we have the uh, Kids Life version of that, which is Baptism, Take the Next Step in Following Jesus. And these are both uh, written in such a way that I think make baptism very clear and very easy to understand. And so if you would be uh, interested in that, stop by and talk to them. We'll put this pool out every week. We were more than willing to do that um, if you're ready to make that decision. So let us know, and uh, we'll, we'll move forward with that. So our very first person that's going to come today is one of our students, Alyssa Calhoun. Let's see, you want to come? And if you'll just come around on this side over here. Yeah. All right. So... If you don't know, it's your first time at Lifeway for baptism, this is a time of celebration for us. We're going to scream, we're going to yell, we're going uh, to get really loud and be excited because of what God's doing in the lives of people. So I'm going to help Alyssa into the tub, but I'll let you know in case you can't hear from there. The, the thing that I do whenever we, uh, we get into, or she gets into the pool, I ask everyone, is have you made a decision to make Jesus Lord of your life? And so she'll answer that question for us in the tub, and then we will baptize her. You ready? So you're going to hold my hand, one red hand here. And one hand here. Okay. Alyssa, have you made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Yes. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations.
Okay. <laughs> you can go out and around if you want to. You can go get dressed if you want to, okay? And then um, our next candidate for baptism is Joe Fleming. So, Joe, you want to come on over? Joe, have you made the decision to make Jesus Lord of your life? Yes. All right, very good. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there we go. Here's your other towel. There you go. All right, we're going to take, that's awesome, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to take one moment and we're going to let our children go back to Kids Life so that we can dismiss in a safe and appropriate way. So we'll let them go. And while they're doing that, I'm just going to step right up here. And uh, I want to tell you where we're going over these next few weeks. So we have one more week left in our series, uh, Religious Trauma. And so we'll wrap that series up next Sunday. And then the first Sunday of September, we're going to begin a brand new series called Family Circus. And this whole series is about, about the importance of family and what we should be prioritizing in our lives. And it applies to you as an individual. It applies to your family. If you're, if you're a single person, you don't have a family, well, you know families, and you also have influence in the lives of families. And so we want you to be uh, in tune and up to date and, and prepared for what questions could be asked of you and how to help people in regards to their family. So we're going to begin that series, Family Circus. It's a five-week series. We're going to start the very first week talking about laying a legacy in the family. And then each week we're going to talk about um, where we find satisfaction, uh, what we prioritize is important, what, we, what we're listening to, if we're listening to God or we're listening to the world. This week we're going to walk through that. And then we're going to come out of that with something that I think is going to be super practical for all of us. And it's very simple how to pray. So we're going to spend about five weeks talking about how to prayer, which will lead us into November. And in November, we're going to do our Be Rich campaign, where we'll be supporting local organizations uh, with our giving and talking about how to manage our money well. So that's all coming up. And when we finish that, well, it's Christmas time, and we'll talk about Christmas. So thank you guys so much for being here today. I want to pray and dismiss, and let's just have... An incredible day celebrating what God's done today in our lives and the lives of so many. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. God, thank you for the way you move. Thank you for the way you work. Thank you for how you have encouraged us, engaged us, and equipped us today. God, we thank you for Alyssa, and we thank you for Joe and their decision to go public with their faith and God, as they're doing so, help us come alongside them and pray for them and encourage them and help them as they grow, as they become more like your son. God, we give you all of this in the powerful name. For the scriptures tell us there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which a man must be saved. So we come to you praying in his name as our Savior and Lord. Amen. You guys have a great day. See you next Sunday.